Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Elevate's Career Discussions with Top Professionals. For those that are new to the platform, Elevate is the largest and fastest growing career network and recruiting platform for business, finance, and investing careers. And it's 100% designed and built by real professionals. Elevate provides recruiting, networking, advice, and training for careers in private equity, investment banking, venture capital and growth equity, hedge funds, and many more. We work with over 5,000 students and candidates and are partnered with the top 30 undergraduate and top 10 MBA universities in the world. All of our programming is built and designed by professionals from the top 50 plus firms in the world. I'm Kaushik, the founder of Elevate and an investment banking and private equity professional, director in private equity and over six years at Goldman Sachs. Career discussions like this one feature top professionals in the industry who've excelled in the top careers and firms in the world. You can check out all of our prior sessions with professionals from the top investment banking, private equity, hedge funds, venture capital firms in the world on our channel right here. Just click subscribe or at elevatelab.org. That's elevatelab.org. Upcoming programming notes. Number one, we're just wrapping up our much anticipated venture capital and growth equity mastery training featuring managing partners from the top Silicon Valley fun, firms and funds, early stage VC and later stage growth. Um, look out for that launching next month. We're also launching a comprehensive career advice portal, which is effectively an on-demand career advice resource from professionals on our platform with over 300 videos on specific topics. Um, and that will also be launched next month and in a brand new networking and job recruiting platform also underway. So without any further ado, today we have an awesome guest on, Jane Dong. She started her career at Goldman Sachs Investment Banking and then skipped the whole on-cycle recruiting process for private equity and then went directly into technology at Uber pre-IPO. She did multiple roles there, Uber Eats, Rides, International Growth, and more. After Uber, she attended one of the top MBA programs in the world at Stanford GSB, and now she's a founder of Frankly, an awesome direct-to-consumer apparel company. So she'll share her lessons learned from entering and starting at Goldman, and then really figuring out and tips to figure out how to find out what you're really actually interested in in your career, and then pursuing those opportunities at the top places in the world. As always, if you found this conversation or any of our stuff helpful, check out more at elevatelab.org and subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Hope you enjoy the discussion and thanks for joining. So, I'm very excited to have Jane on today. Uh, Jane, I'd love to start today with, with your background, um, maybe give folks uh, an understanding of, of where you've been and, and what you're working on right now. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Fremont, California, you know, a really fun suburb um, in the Bay Area. And I was a pretty competitive golfer growing up, and I was recruited at a couple different schools to play golf there, um, some Pac-10 schools, some Big Ten schools. Um, ended up choosing Columbia because I really wanted to be a student first um, instead of an athlete first. And so um, I went to Columbia. I was an economics major there. And I worked at a hedge fund my, after my freshman summer, um, worked in Goldman ECM my sophomore summer, was in industrials, IBD my junior summer, and then went back to industrials full time. I was in industrials full time for about a year before I moved over to Uber. Um, I knew pretty quickly that I actually wanted to be on the operation side. Um, we'll talk more about that later. Um, but I did spend three years there. I worked on everything from you know New Jersey rides to like New York City competition, like talking about Juno all day and Lyft and um, Via everybody. And then I ended my time. Oh, and I went over to India um, for four months to work on driver growth. And then I ended my time there um, working on U uh, U.S. and Canada Uber Eats driver acquisition spend. Um, we call them couriers, um, but, you know, that is a very industry specific word. And so, yeah, so I decided to go back to business school um, after my time at Uber. I was actually a deferred applicant, which we can also talk more about um, in terms of how that works for college students. Um, and so I decided to actually go back after four total years of work experience. And I spent two years at Stanford GSB. Um, I had an awesome time there. You know, I've always been super into sports, took lots of sports classes, um, but my um, key focus there was really starting a company. And so my second year, I took the famous Startup Garage class, and now I'm working on Frankly, which is a braless women's apparel brand. Um, you don't have to wear a bra with any of our clothes. 
And so we are currently building that and yeah, I'll turn it back over. Awesome. Thank you, Jane. A lot of different amazing experiences. We're going to delve into all of those, uh, all those topics. But before we do that, where can our sort of audience find out more about Frankly? You know, I think it's a fantastic brand that you guys are building. So maybe tell us more about how they can find out more. Yeah, you guys can follow us on Instagram at Frankly Apparel. Um, we're franklyapparel.com. And we're also on TikTok, um, frankly, at Frankly Apparel there also. Awesome. Amazing. Um, so great. So you guys can check out Jane and, and, and the story there. Let's maybe uh, start, uh, I want to kind of take this in, in pieces, start back at sort of your first few experiences in finance. You know, for a lot of people that are looking um, maybe early on in their career, how did you break into this industry, right? You, you broke into, a, you know, an activist hedge fund. So that's, that's, you know, really hard to do, but maybe give some advice on, on how you did it. Was it persistence? You know, was it sort of just sort of figuring it out, making relationships, you know, what worked? Honestly, in hindsight, now I know how hedge fund recruiting works, um, but I found a hedge fund that actually was just starting up in February. I emailed them in, I think, like, November. I might have saw, like, a, like, possible job posting, but basically I kept, like, I emailed and cold called, like, probably, like, 30 different places, which obviously no one got back to me except for the one that was just starting up. And so he gave me a call. He goes, you know, do you know any accounting? And I said, no. He goes, do you know finance? And I also said, no, I'm an economics major. I'm a freshman. And he said, do you realize the only thing you're qualified to do is bring me coffee? And apparently my answer back to him was "Then I will bring you coffee. Um, and so I think for me, I think the thing to remember for any freshman looking for something is honestly, you need to do like three useful things. Like you are only going to have space for on your resume for probably three useful things you did. It doesn't matter if you were buying highlighters during the rest of your time there. One of my projects while I was there, like, you know, obviously I did a lot of analysis, really started understanding like, you know, how investors think, like what kind of metrics you look at, how to say EBITDA properly. Um, but another one of my projects was like tying up a tree because, you know, I had to Google like how to make a tree stand up because the tree was starting to lean. And that was one of the things that I did that summer. But am I going to put that on my resume? Like, obviously not. Um, and so just remember, like when you're thinking about it, it doesn't have to be perfectly related. I think every internship tells you these are things that I like and these are things that I didn't like about this job and it helps inform your next decision. And so not to be too hung up on like, oh, well, you know, my friend worked at JP their freshman summer and I wasn't able to. Like that really won't make a difference by the time full-time recruiting rolls around and just make sure you're learning about yourself and getting some of the skills that might be relevant down the line. Yeah, it's super helpful. The persistence and the attitude and sort of just taking on anything in that role and sort of really owning it. I think I think all that stuff resonates. Totally agree with that. Um, then let's maybe fast forward a little bit. You spent a summer at, at ECM at Goldman and then you spent a summer and then full time at, at IBD. Maybe compare and contrast to the audience that are looking at capital markets versus traditional investment banking. Like what are some of the things you felt were similarities, differences and how they should think about that, that decision? Yeah, for sure. Um, I will say I think the biggest difference in terms of day to day between my two internships is with ECM because you're a little bit more markets driven. Sometimes you are glued to your seat and you're, you're like, I can't go to the bathroom. I can't go get my lunch. I can't do any of these things because you do have to like sometimes send updates to people on like, you know, this is exactly what the stock price is doing right now or, um, you know, executing a block trade or like any of those types of things. Um, you know, you will feel like you're glued to your seat. It is set up more like a trading floor. And so sometimes you will sit literally elbow to elbow with your MD. There's a little bit more space when you move up to like, you know, a coverage group like, you know, industrials, uh, for example. And so, you know, I got a little bit more elbow room. I wasn't sitting exactly right next to my MD. And so that was different in terms of that. I think also the skill set you get is obviously different, right? Like the valuation work is mostly done upstairs, like in like, you know, your coverage group or IBD. Um, and like, obviously every bank is set up a little bit differently. Some groups have separate M&A groups that will help you like, you know, do some of the modeling, but like at Goldman industrials, like you were like the coverage group was doing all of that. Um, and so, yeah, so like the pace is a little bit different. Um, the work is a little bit different. I think, you know, there's a lot of work figuring out like, you know, getting more color on how investors react to a roadshow, like those kinds of things that you'll get in ECM that are super interesting and obviously super relevant depending on what you decide to do. But if you are looking into doing like straight private equity, doing buyout, like I would probably say the valuation skill set you get upstairs is a lot more relevant. Super helpful. Um, and for the folks that are interested or going into ECM type of careers, what are, you know, obviously they, they can do that for as long as they want, but what are some uh, typical like exit routes that you've seen out of, out of those types of careers? Yeah, um, I've seen people do things like, um, you know, like at TPG, do like investor relations or actually do fundraising. 
um, because they've had so much so much experience, like kind of reading investors and understanding like how they reacted to like, you know, instead of a single stock now, like now your funds raise. Um, so I think some of those soft skills they really build in ECM. I think things that are a little bit more market focused, like a lot of them move actually back into capital markets, maybe somewhere else I've seen. Um, some people move into different products. Like, so some people are like, I'm actually really interested in debt. I'm going to move into DCM or move into private placements. Um, but there's a lot of like different types of routes that people have exited in. Um, and like some people do move straight to like, you know, coverage banking. And I've also seen other people actually move to, um, maybe like a, not exactly like, you know, the U S buyouts group of a private equity firm, but maybe like something like, you know, mass debt or like something like that. Um, I've seen all sorts of exits there. Got it. Yeah, that's super helpful. I think it's, I think there's some some decisions I think you make over a course of a career. Do you like companies? Do you like individual stocks or bonds or so that trading aspect of things? You know, do you like the people aspects, the management team aspects? So there's so many things other than just numbers that to Jane's point, you want to sort of figure out. And there's, there's great jobs for everyone. It's as much about for you finding out sort of what, what are the things that you really like amongst, amongst these things. Now let's um, fast forward a little bit to investment banking where you spent a summer and then, then, then as a full-time. Um, what in your mind were, are, are some of the keys to success in that role as sort of an associate or an analyst, um, you know, when you first started, you know, picking that as a first job out of college? Yeah, I think managing up is the number one thing. And honestly, that still goes with you wherever you are. Um, you know, making sure that people above you, like everybody talks about like, oh, how do you manage reports, et cetera. But when you are literally like the bottom of the totem pole, right? Like how do you manage the expectations of other people? This isn't like consulting where you have one project and one like, you know, engagement manager that you're talking to all the time. You have like five associates, right? And like at any time, like, you know, four of them could be chasing you for something. How do you set expectations and what do you do? Because you are technically on some level a resource, right? Like, how do you deal with it when everybody wants a piece of this resource and like you're one person? Um, and so how do you deal with that? And so I think a lot of it is like really like clear communication. It's like, you know, I have this team that has a debt due tomorrow versus like, you know, maybe this client service that could wait, but like, you know, you have to remember as a banking analyst, your associates getting pressure from the top down and a good associates knows how to deflect that pressure. But like, it is a lot and they're not going to be perfect. And sometimes if they start putting the pressure down on you and they're like, I need this right now, it might not be because of them. And so figuring out how to manage that relationship and manage that conversation, I think is super important because, you know, you're trapped together. Like you don't want this relationship to go sour. Right. And so like, is there a time where you bring the two associates together and you're like, I will work on this for two hours and then I will do your work or maybe let them like kind of talk it out. I think that's probably the most important thing and the thing that can make your banking experience super, super painful or a lot better than it, like, you know, than it would have been. Um, that's probably the number one thing that I think about. Got it. Maybe comment on what people can do to um, accelerate on the learning curve, right? So obviously the first few months, I remember when I started at Goldman, um, the first three months were the, some of the hard, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know where to start. So, so what are some of the resources that, that you, you think people can just do, or just as maybe something they do where they, where they spend more time kind of understanding the problem, you know, what are things people can do that could really help them in the first few months? Yeah, I think the first few months, especially if you're not staffed, figure out who was the best analyst in the class above you get their model, look at how they built it and look at how they ran their scenarios. Because like, you know, a messy model is like the most painful thing ever. And like, we did unfortunately have a team where like, there were like two different group coverage groups sharing one model and there'd be hard codes and everybody's like, I didn't do it. Right. And so making sure you know how to build like the cleanest models, like, you know, very clear outputs and like how they lay things out, how they structure things, how they thought through things. I think that is probably like the best thing you can do if you are not busy, like rebuild their model, like figure out why they did what they did. Great, great point. Um, and then uh, on the recruiting side, like you probably got inbounds from hundreds of candidates who were in college when you were in banking at Goldman. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what you looked for, you know, whether it's on a resume or in their background. Um, and then, you know, what determined if you were going to take that coffee chat or that info session, yeah. whatever that they requested for. Uh, use the right bank name for like, first of all, I can't tell you how many emails I got that had center bridge credit Suisse. We get so many emails, even as analysts. And I think making sure you have the freaking right bank name in there is like triple check that please. Cause it's like shocking. Like I would probably say you can weed out like a good 15% of people just like that. Um, I think the second thing that I also did was there's a copy of like, we use Outlook, right? And a lot of us turn our screens gray. 
I can tell when you copied and pasted because there's different color backgrounds um, depending on where you cut. And so I can tell if you spent a lot of time writing my email or if you didn't. And so before you send it, like highlight everything, make the font the same size, make it the same color, like make sure it might look normal on your screen, but I can tell you when it comes to me, sometimes it just looks bizarre. And so you want to make sure your formatting's right. And so I can't tell, like, even if you copied and pasted, if I can't tell, like, I can't like judge you for it. Right. And then I would say the third thing is like, obviously if there's some personal connection, right. So for me, I was a college golfer. I reached out a lot to like, honestly, like the football team, because there a lot of them were big donors, like, you know, to like actually women's golf. Um, and so people who you have a connection with, you know, like, and figuring out if there is some kind of warm intro that you can get, but like, obviously that's not, a luxury that everybody has if you're in a non-target school you got to like try and find your other one non-target person who went to your school like find that connection so that they want to respond to your email because like when you get like 80 of them a day you're like oh my god i like i just have to use these like arbitrary means of filtering this out um and so that's kind of how we, i like went through the whole process of like reading through that's these. super that's i love that it's like practical um you know advice and actually it's true because i think because of the volume that you get, you want to make sure that you're not sort of making some of these silly mistakes. And it actually really matters because a lot of the banking job is like formatting and sort of, you know, those things. And I think we look for those things as well. So I totally agree with you. Even things like, you know, checking, like people say, hey, can we chat on Friday, December the 5th? And it's actually the 6th. And there's sort of like a mismatch. And you're like, well, this isn't exactly like what I was thinking. So uh, really, really good points on just, check, you know, attention to detail because that's what's important in the job. So it's sort of yeah. like reflective of what you need, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I, I know some of our analysts had the gray screens up. I, I, I did at some point in my time, but that's, that's a really good point actually you bring up. Um, okay, so that's just your journey. So as your peers are all sort of, and you yourself are getting inbounds from all the headhunters on like PE and, and, and you know, growth equity and, and et cetera, um, sort of maybe walk us through your decision process on why you wanted to try, you know, technology and sort of something outside of finance. Sure. I think it is super tempting like, because you know, the jobs comp better, you know, your lifestyle will be a little bit better, you know, like you could still do the similar job just a little bit better. Yeah. Um, and so I think it is super tempting. So for me, I realized pretty quickly, I didn't love the financial engineering part when we talked about like inversions and like reincorporating in Switzerland and like all these things, like I wasn't getting excited. I actually was super interested in like, what happens after we pitch this merger? Like what actually happens after we do this carve out? Like, what actually happens like, you know, in the end, like what kind of synergies are actually realized. And so for me, I was really thinking about like, okay, this seems to be in operations and that is not what I'm doing right now. And so I realized pretty quickly, I was like, I probably should not recruit for private equity. Like that is probably not a great fit for me. Like, cause I'm going to be building LBOs until they come out of my ears. Right. And so like, I'm probably not going to know what actually happens. Like sometimes maybe after it, cause maybe it gets turned over to an operating team, like, you know, et cetera. And so I knew pretty quickly, but I still had a lot of those conversations anyway, because you do have a little bit of that FOMO and you're like scared. You're like, oh, what if I'm missing out? And so I think it takes a lot of conviction, honestly, if you're not going to go that route. Like we actually have a lot of friends who have now reached out. Like, you know, I have the benefit of hindsight now that I'm happy that I did what I did and didn't recruit. But we have a lot of friends now who are like five years in and they're like, Jane, like, I still don't know what I want to do. Like, I just did the PE thing and I'm still kind of lost. Like, what should I do now? I was like, I don't know. Like, I have no idea like what you should be doing. Like only you really know that. And so, you know, I would say if you like finance, right? If you like any parts of the job, like if you like like the modeling part, if you are like, I really like talking to these companies, like I would say like, it does not hurt to go through PE. I think it has great placement. You learn a lot of great skills in it. But if you are like, I do not enjoy this, like maybe consider not recruiting and like thinking about industry jobs. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, because I think pr pr if you decide to go down the MBA path, which we'll get to in a second, um, doing what you do pre-MBA actually really matters, right? Yeah. So the, the, far, the further you push back, I, I totally agree with Jane's point, the further you push back that self-introspective journey of finding things that you actually like, you sort of end back on square one just now four or five years down the path. And it's sort of, I always think of the opportunity cost of time as the biggest opportunity cost in your life and your career. So I think that it's a brilliant point, I think, Jane, that you're bringing up. So maybe now talk us towards a little bit about what attracted you specifically 
kind of to technology. You obviously joined, and we'll get to your recruiting process in a second for Uber, but you joined a high growth pre-IPO, you know, just 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 this journey that was incredible when you joined, you know, in, in, in when you joined the company. But what attached your technology? How did you determine, hey, these are the types of companies I want to reach out to, you know, consumer, mobility, you know, those types of things. And what are the decision points that you had? Yeah, I think for me, I have, I had still a big point of risk aversion, right? I think like anybody who goes into banking on some level, you have some like a decent, like high risk averse, like personality on some level. And so for me, that first jump was actually very scary. I said, in the company that I look at, like, you couldn't have a lot of money in the bank, like that is actually a plus for me. But I need to know you're going to be around in about a year or two, because I can't be making like, you know, these jumps all the time. And like, if the company goes down, I think that was a big fear for me. And so when I was filtering for companies, I was like, okay, what is related? And I really wanted something with like somewhat of a physical product at the time, given like my exposure to industrials. And so Uber really felt like the perfect fit there because one of my really close friends from Molis actually was the one who referred me. He was like, I'm on the New Jersey team. We do all sorts of analysis, to try and make this market run better. We do all sorts of different things that your skills actually transfer. And obviously, while it's still like a little bit scared because you're like, you don't know if you're going to be good at this job or not. Like, you know, you've only ever done finance. You're like, OK, like if I make this jump, like what is going to happen? And I think I really made the jump like and I was less scared to because I had, you know, the deferred admission for Stanford in my back pocket. And so that made me way less scared. I was like, you know what, even if this is the worst three years of my life, like or two years of my life, it'll be totally fine. I can like have a reset when I go to business school. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of people who are looking from banking. I get that it's really hard because like everybody, if I think about in my industrials group, everyone except one other person who actually also started a company, like everybody else is still in finance and everybody else is still like, they're all VPs actually now in like, you know, at like Insight or, um, you know, like they're going to like Capital Group, um, like amazing, amazing roles, like dream jobs for a lot of people. Um, but I think it's a really hard coming from a group like industrials, like not doing finance, right? And so like when you're looking around at what there is out there, um, people will try to shove you into fp &A roles. And if you are like sure that you're interested in something else, like hold firm on that and you will be able to find something. Um, and like, it might not be the perfect company. Um, but for me, I was like, I need someone to take a chance on me for operations specifically. And that's why like I ended up at Uber because a lot of other people were like, you don't have office ops experience. Like this isn't right. Um, and so they were yeah, willing to give me this. That's a great point. That's my follow up question. Like finding the right types of roles at these companies. So like, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, I think you're right, operations is great. I think business development, these are types of roles that people, people. so what are the types of roles yeah. do you think that are exciting enough that people should consider? And what are the types, you, you alluded to this on that FNA side, what are the types of ones that you should yeah. sort of be a little uh, skeptical about? Yes, I would say actually in terms of business development, it can mean 50 billion things. Like be very careful when you're taking a business development role because it could mean like cold calling random people and like that might not be what you like at all. It can also mean M&A, right? And so you got to really figure out like what do these roles mean, right? Because there's not, it's not as standard as finance where you're like, okay, yeah, this is what this means. Associate manager, like those leveling like things like don't really like every company uses it differently, right? Like they're post MBAs going into associate roles like at a company. Um, versus while that's normal for like, you know, B school and like Goldman, like that is not as normal in terms of looking at industry jobs. And so when thinking about what types of roles would be interesting, I will tell you, like, you know, you could love, love FPNA. Some people love FPNA. I knew I didn't want to do FPNA, but because you have the finance experience, like they will try to put you there. Some people really want to do strategy. Strategy is actually a really cool group. A lot of times, like you really get a high level overview. If you're a person who doesn't want to be in the weeds, like that is a place you might want to go. But the warning there is that you're competing against like the McKinsey kids. And a lot of times they will want the McKinsey kids over you because they're better at some of the market sizing, maybe some of the channel analysis, et cetera. Um, so if that's something you want, you kind of have to know you're going to have to fight for it on some level. Um, chief of staff roles are pretty trendy. Once again, like be very careful. Chief of staff can mean you're booking flights or it can mean you're sitting in board meetings, like figure out which one it is and like understand like where you fall. Um, and so, you know, I would say like there are probably interesting things about every role. Like I think your advantage as a banking analyst is really your analytical skill, your modeling skills and your understanding of accounting and finance and obviously play to those strengths um, and you should. But like if you do really want something else, like figure out how to pitch yourself for it because it might not be that easy. That's great advice. Um, and, and I think implicit in that, and Jane did a good job of characterizing the risk component of here, like, you know, one part of the risk is if that is something you really want to do, don't 
keep pushing it off. Oh, I'll do this. I'll do this after or whatever. If that's something you're really interested in, think about it. And number two, finding that right company, which, which Jane did kind of, what is that, that, that bridges your risk a reward dynamic, right? So or joining something early enough, but also being established enough such that you don't feel like you've just gone to a great school or, you know, whatever you've gone to this great bank. And then now you're sort of in this, in this pool where you don't know where it's going to end up. So, and then the last thing I'll say on that point, which we'll get to in a, in a second is business school, actually, it, 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 it tends to, normalize people, but it also tends to, you know, if you have a story of why you did something, I think that could actually be helpful. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second, Jane. But before we jump off the, the transition part, what were your interviews like? You know, what skills did you have to demonstrate when you, when you, when you, uh, when you interview Uber? Yeah, I think one thing you do have to remember also, every hire is a risk on some level for a hiring manager. They're looking at ways to mitigate their own risk. And if you are a risk and they have to take a risk on you, you better give them a good reason why. I went through so many interviews, like, it's not even funny because like a lot of people couldn't understand like why are you wanting to leave this job don't you have a two-year contract and like for context at the time goldman did not you were like employed at will and so i was like technically no um and so people really don't get why you want to leave and even if you're a great candidate like you could still be seen as a risk right and so for me a lot of the interview processes ended up being like you know a couple phone calls like maybe a phone call with the hiring like first recruiter then hiring manager then maybe another one with another person and then you would go for like a super day type thing where you would talk to three or four people at once. And then sometimes they came back again and were like, can you talk to the hiring manager again? Um, and so, you know, that was typically the process. And like in between, there might be a case study, depending on where it was, um, trying to see like, you know, what your actual skills were in terms of like doing some of the work that they would want you to do. Um, and so, yeah, so like the interview processes can be pretty time consuming and like a little bit more painful than like, you know, maybe like PE process is like really painful because it's like a week, like a blitz of like, just like, you know, not sleeping for a week again um, while having like your associates chasing you. Right. But like, this is different in the sense that it's like, it takes stamina, like the job search outside of like finance, I think takes sometimes can take a lot of stamina because you also have to get lucky and wait. Like you have to wait until that role opens up. You have to like kind of watch a careers page or like connect with someone at and like if there's someone you really want to work for, you kind of have to wait for them to get headcount, right? Because like that's how companies work. And so it's it can be a slog. Like it can be much different than like what you're expecting. And like, you know, you're like, I worked at this great bank. I worked in this great group. It should be easy for me. It is not always easy. And like the process is not short. And so like just make sure you are going to have the patience and like think through that part of it and how you like pitch yourself. Um, I guess another tactical thing is that when we interviewed at Uber, an example of like an answer we always looked for because we wanted like hustle because that was like what we really were into at the time um we wanted you to like be willing to go do like driver support like be willing to like go stand in a parking lot and direct traffic like you know at an event like and like manage like brand ambassadors and so there was a question we would ask we were like you know let's say something's down and like a customer is not like you know let's pretend like this is eat like not getting their food like what would you do and so people would go through all these like tech solutions, but the answer a lot of people were really looking for is I would pick up the food and bring it myself. Like that is what a lot of people were looking for. And so understanding what that company is like and what their personality is and what they're kind of trying to get at, like that is literally like what is probably the most important is like if someone was perfect and they were like, yeah, I wouldn't get the food, like you pass on them. Right, right. especially for uh, the amazing insight there. Um, you know, especially as a banking analyst, if you're, you're kind of used to sitting at your desk all day, right? It's a little bit of a counterintuitive yeah. question. Um, but it's sort of like the analyst role, right? Back to that, where if, if we were on a road show, I remember we went on a road show and, you know, we were accompanying management teams and we would literally go, you know, early and then like, you know, get everyone coffee and do all the, and like literally whatever you need to do to make the client happy in this case as a customer. So I think, I think absolutely right in terms of at the end of the day, um, that's sort of the drive that I think a lot of people are looking for. Now let's move to your, 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 your few years at Uber. Um, maybe help people understand, like you had a variety of roles, right? So maybe take each of them, you know, the, the rides team, the eats team, yes. and then, and then India, and then talk to us a little about what was the most exciting parts of each of those businesses. Oh man. Okay. So we'll start on New Jersey. That is the team I joined. That was a super fun team. Like this role doesn't exist anymore, honestly, because like they don't have city teams anymore. Um, they have like regional teams, like a New York or like, you know, a Northeast regional team that does everything um, because it's like kind of a running business. But back in the day, Uber's model was they would have local teams. They would parachute some people in and like have them launch a business, literally go to a hotel ballroom and sign up drivers and hand up iPhone fours. Like that is like what we used to do. Like, and like, we used to have to go like 
they called it slog. You had to go get taxi drivers. Like you had to go to where they hung out and like try and get a bunch of them to sign up. Right. Like literally it was like a lot of that in person, like, just like, you know, you, like, and I think some of it, it can be hard for someone who comes from banking. Right. Cause that's why they always ask. They're like, you know, you're used to like hanging out with the CFO. Now you're like trying to get a taxi driver to drive. Like that is very different. And so that was awesome for me because I really saw like the impact of the business and like talking to drivers and all that, like in the very beginning was like super awesome in conjunction with things like, how do I get like drivers who don't drive anymore to re-engage? Like, can I figure out why people churn? Churn was a big project for me for a while. Um, I worked on things like pricing, like, you know, should we do a price cut in hindsight? We shouldn't have, but at the time we thought we had to. So we did a price cut, um, making those calls to drivers, big soft skill lesson, like, it is not fun to be like, hey, you get to drive 30% more and earn exactly the same amount of money. Like, haha. Like, that was like a very, like, kind of painful conversation, honestly. Um, and like, you know, at the time you did believe you were increasing efficiency, et cetera. And you're like, okay, like, this is right for the business. But like, in hindsight, I'm like, oh, man, we really shouldn't have cut prices then. Um, and then like other things like, you know, incentives, you're like, okay, now we cut prices. What do we do? We're surging like crazy. How do we incentivize more drivers to drive? You do incentives and you try to incentivize the right behavior. And so I did incentives for probably about like a year. Like that is like burn calculation. How do we structure it? Where do we set these thresholds? Are there requirements that they need to like meet this? And this is before they built the like internal incentive system where you could just like click and drag. Like I was doing everything in Excel and querying. And so like that, there was a lot of fear of like, if I mess this up, there's going to be 300 drivers outside the support center tomorrow, like, you know, coming after me. So my math better be right. Like every cell has to be right. Um, and so thankfully nothing crazy ever happened there. Um, and so, yeah. And then like competition, et cetera. So that's New Jersey. I will pause and see if there's anything that you have to say. No, that. no, no. That's amazing. So you were basically like brains and operations behind launching a, a whole new market. And then I think what's interesting about what, what Jane just said is like, the entirety of the role is so diverse, right? So on one hat, you're wearing like an operations hat, then you're wearing a finance hat, then you're wearing a pricing hat, then a marketing hat, then a community, you know, like a customer management hat, then, then like a client management hat with, your, with, with the drivers. So that's a lot of work. So like, how do you, I mean, is it trial by fire? Like, do you distinct, cause you're coming from a finance background, albeit for a year and a half, um, you know, like you just, they just put you in these positions. You're supposed to like, how do you react to someone who's, two or three years out of undergrad doing all those different roles or you just got to figure it out? I think you have to figure it out. And also like for context, like they generally didn't really love hiring people who are like a year out of school. Like they, a lot of the people who took this role, especially earlier on were like four or five years out of school, had a couple of jobs. And so, yeah, in my case, it was really trial by fire, but I think there was something like in terms of the banking thing that translated and like, they really believed that I could do the job. And like, in the end, I obviously loved that time, like, cause it was so fun. And it was like, we were a big team and we were just doing whatever we could to make sure this market like didn't go down. And a lot of people would ask me, they're like, what do you need to do? And I was like, you think the car is just magically there when you call it? Like, obviously like someone probably paid them to be there or like, you know, drew like a geofence like around the area, like, and so like people always forget, like it does take a lot of ops. And now obviously things run a lot easier. There's less driver education that's needed because people know like, I need to hang around downtown areas or like I need to do X, Y, Z. But back in the day, it was a lot of like, they would sit at home in the burbs really far from everything and be like, I'm not getting any pings. And so there was a lot of like, even like for me now, like it also showed me what I'm not good at. I'm not good at writing driver comms. Like I should never write driver communications. And like in the end, like, you know, obviously like there's like things you can and can't say in terms of like employment and like, you can't be too directive. Um, but yeah, like for me, I was like, I really should never write driver comms ever again. And like now I rarely um right driver communication or like any kind of communications honestly like because my co-founder does a lot of that um right. but yeah it did take like that period of time like that about year and a half taught me a lot in terms of like what i was good at and what i wasn't that's fascinating I, I think that is exactly the sort of realization you need to get at whether you do all the work you know i think pre-mba if you can get to that rec realization of what you're good at and what you're really not and what you like doing and what you really don't that's the best thing you could do for your career so let's again I, the last thing on uber i want to talk about is the eats so now we see how huge it's grown to and, and you know partly also a from the growth but b also from the environment we're in but maybe take us back to the early stages of when you were there and sort of what mm -hmm. what your experience like was was in that team yeah, so what we saw on rides that happened was there was a lot of centralization, right? Local teams were kind of like 
people were like, y'all can't spend a million dollars in a weekend on incentives, right? And uh, like for obvious reasons. And so like, you know, I understood that. And so like, we had always been very like, I think fiscally responsible as a local team. Um, but they basically were like, okay, this is wild. Like we have like a billion different teams doing like a million different like things. And so we need to kind of get this under control. And so they started trying to centralize a lot of the spend, a lot of the incentives, everything. And obviously this resulted in an overall restructuring of where we became like a New York, New Jersey, like Connecticut, like Boston, like, you know, basically like all together team and you worked on one very specific thing. Um, and so, you know, that centralization happened. And as I saw it happen, I was like, okay, you know, this is obviously something that every company does when they grow up. And instead of being the person who's being centralized, which I'm sure like a lot of people will have experience like down the line, I was like, how do I become the person who's actually doing the centralizing? Like, how do I join, like, do I join the central team and like figure out how we actually like make decisions, not just as an individual local market, but how do we build a scalable solution? Um, and so that's what really appealed to me actually about the funnel team, um, like driver acquisition team basically for Uber Eats is, you know, th at the time referrals, um, paid media, everything, all the spend was like, kind of like every local market did whatever they wanted. And they would all ping this one person who sat in San Francisco be like, hey, can you like crank our paid media? We need more drivers. Um, and so they really wanted to stop that kind of short-term thinking, do a little bit of better planning. And so like, basically I ended up building like, you know, this model that tried to predict like six weeks out, like how many drivers would need, like, and you need to pull levers about six weeks in advance because that's how long like it took um, for, um, drivers to like onboard, et cetera. You have to go through background checks, all these things. They're not just here tomorrow. And so basically for me, it was like centralizing that. How do we set referrals? Like, how do we build a structure to set referrals in all these like different places? How do we build a structure to like decide how much we need to spend on paid media? Um, and then the channels, like, you know, I kind of left that to a lot of the channel managers in terms of how to divide that budget, but like every single city, you know, like I would negotiate with the city also, like, you know, you could do it in two different ways. You can just be like, I'm doing this. I'm dropping the hammer and I don't care what you say, but having been on the other side of being centralized, I was like, these people actually have a lot of localized knowledge and they spend more time than me, like thinking about this market than like, they spend more time than anybody else thinking about this market. And so like trying to actually work with them and like create that process to actually centralize it, um, I think was like probably one of the biggest projects I did there. And I thought was really awesome. Amazing. Um, so, so that's, that's awesome. And you kind of see, um, I think when you were at Uber, right before business school, it sort of went through the pre-IPO phase and then, you know, a little bit more of a streamlining as a large company. So I'm sure, I mean, as I can only imagine such a tremendous experience building it up. So now let's uh, like amazing experience there. Let's obviously that laid a foundation in you on operations and, and entrepreneurship. Maybe let's go to your MBA. We have a lot of students in the audience who kind of, when, when I do these sessions on campus, they sort of ask me like, you know, how do you know if you need to go get an MBA, right? So, so you know, and, and, and obviously that's a tough decision, but maybe walk us through your MBA experience and then sort of maybe also help people answer that question. When should you go get an MBA and, and sort of, you know, how should you mentally get ready for that? Yeah, I think, you know, depending on who you are, right? Like if you have a lot of clarity on what you want to do, like, you know, you might not need an MBA. I think here's the thing. The MBA now is a lot more of a personal decision than before. Back in the day, you probably had to get one to advance. Um, and so nowadays, like, it's really like, do I want this life experience? And do I want these two years to think about like what I really want to do? And, you know, obviously this is a very expensive two years. Um, can I say like right this second, like I know there's a hundred percent like ROI on the dollar value. Like I can't say that. Can I say that my life is a lot happier because of the relationships I built and like all the things that I did during that time, I would say like wholeheartedly yes. And so in terms of whether or not it's right for you, like if you're someone who's like, I know exactly what I want to do, like maybe don't go get an MBA. If you have a very strong career pivot you want to do, I would say the MBA is an awesome time to do that. Um, it really gives you time to reflect, but also gives you time to do that pivot. Um, and like, it can also be a great life reset. Um, I think if there's also skills that you want to build, like pretend you didn't have a banking background, right. And you're like, I don't really have any business acumen and I want to go into this. Like, you know, my engineer friends like loved their MBA time. Like some of my friends who did like TFA also learned a ton. Um, but I would probably say like the actual like classroom, like you'll have to be pretty selective on what classes you take. Um, but I would say like the value of it really is not necessarily in like precisely like you're you sitting in the classroom. A lot of it is going to be what you learn from your peers. And so like whether or not deciding on whether or not this is like right for you, like I would say like 
obviously it like sucks to say it varies because like I have so many friends who didn't go who are like thank god I didn't go I'm $220,000 richer and I'm like that is amazing I wish I were also um but like you know I think like in hindsight like I've loved my time there and I think obviously I would not have met my co-founder um you know without GSP. yeah yeah, I, I think it's, you're exactly right. Like, it's such a personal decision. Um, I, I don't necessarily think, I agree with you. I, I don't necessarily think you need it anymore for all these careers because there's other ways these days, whether it's kind of social media, you know, yourself, you can you can brand yourself, right, in other ways. You can build that personal brand in a lot of different ways than just saying, hey, I need to get this MBA. That said, I think to your point, the network aspect is amazing. And then that uh, the ability to sort of be in that ecosystem with other amazingly high performers, I think that's that's the other um, other other really, really positive thing there. Um, how do you, how did you, I know you, you kind of did the deferred, maybe talk a little bit about the deferred process and how you differentiate yeah. yourself in that process. Yeah, so the deferred process was, um, you have to plan. You can't just like roll up and be like, oh, I'll apply deferred. Cause like, you gotta take the test, right? Like you gotta do the GRU or the GMAT. Back in the day, the GRU was not allowed. And to be like completely frank, I struggled with the GMAT. I took it like three or four times. And so it is like, if you are good at the SAT, like throw that all out the window. Like I was great at the SAT terrible at the GMAT. And so the GMAT was just like pulling teeth for me. And so I took it like three or four times. I ended up like, I think now like most of the deferred programs are like round three so that they don't have to deal with you during round one or two. But at the time there was still an advantage of applying round one as a deferred applicant. And I couldn't make it because I was having such a hard time with the test. And so like, once you get that in order, you're like, okay, great. Like now it's like how to present yourself, right? And so obviously you have no work experience, like that's fine. I think this is probably where your recs become super, super important. I think like for me, um, like my recommendations came from like the manager I work with at the hedge fund and then my golf coach actually, which is like a little bit out of the blue. Um, but I think they really showcased the sides of me that were like really important for me to show in this application. Um, and so, yeah, I think those were like really key things there in terms of preparing for it. Like make sure you have your recs ready. Like that is like a really big ask of somebody and like do it early and don't do it three weeks before it's due. Um, and like, make sure you have your test in order because if you don't have that number, like you, you're, it's not going to be fun for you. Like that is like the bare minimum and that is something you can control. Um, like it's going to be hard, but like, you know, if you're not a math Olympiad, like some of my friends were and breeze through the GMAT, like you're gonna to have to work at it and it's not gonna be that great. I agree with you. Um, I completely agree with you. I think, I think the GMAT is, is definitely, I remember when, we, when I took it, it was just, it was a lot of like, you have to prep for it, et cetera. Um, on the essay por portion, uh, I get a lot from my, our college students, the undergrads that, that are in Elevate, like, you know, like how do you really differentiate and talk about what you think you wanna do five years from now? Like, so, so yeah. what do you write about, right? Yeah, so I can tell you guys what I wrote about. So I, like, basically I wrote about at the time, um, I wanted to get an MBA because I wanted to work for the NFL and BD and I did not have those marketing skills. I grew up as a football fan, you know, and like, you know, obviously now it's like a little bit more difficult for me to be as enthusiastic about football because of a, a lot of the things that have happened like with Kaepernick, et cetera. And so, you know, while I like that sport will always have a very special place in my heart, like obviously my goals are changed, like, and like not exactly the same, but at the time, like I wrote about something that is probably considered out there. Right. Um, like, you know, when I was like thinking through what I could write about, I was like, I can write about being an industrial CEO, like, you know, like CEO of GM. And I was like, you know what, like, what do I actually really feel strongly about? And I was like, okay, well, you know, when the Super Bowl was in New York, I stood outside in line for like three hours to like get, like it was Dante Whitner's like signature at the time on this giant Niners flag. And like that just like really, like I think resonated with probably the people who read my essay. And so even if you feel like you're like, okay, this might be a wild dream, um, you should still write about it. Um, obviously I think like for me, it tied really well because it's like to do BD and to like grow the sport, like you need the marketing skills. And I obviously didn't have that cause I was an econ major and I worked in banking. Right. And so like showing them why you need them also is like a good thing to do because like, obviously like they're humans reading this and they also want to feel like, you know, their school is like helping that, like, you know, it's not just like a one way relationship. And so like they want to connect with you and they also want to like better understand like you know why you are trying to be there yeah a great point i mean having gone i mean we just went through another round this right now where, where it's sort of around you know the rounds for, yeah. for business school and pop prior years i think what's really differentiated people in that business school journey um on the essay side at least has been sort of that whatever it is like personal to you i think being sort of demonstrating that you want to 
be excel in, in that. We say, I see a lot of people that deviate to the mean and say, hey, I want to be, you know, a private equity partner. I'm like, you don't really, yes, you may need to go to business school, but you don't really need, need that. Or, you know, it's, it's not, it's not like it doesn't make for a great story, nor does it sort of actually resonate with people as much as saying, hey, like, I really want to use this to become, you know, a leader in this industry that I'm really interested in. So, so that's really, really good point. And then lastly on GSB, I think, um, obviously, you know, tremendous platform, you know, we work with them on the Elevate side, but like maybe comment a little bit around sort of your, your experience there, kind of like you, you talked a little bit about the classes, but sort of and finding your co-founder, but like, well, how did you maximize your experience there? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So maximizing your time there, you will have a lot of FOMO, like when you are in business school, do not let that FOMO drive you to do 50 different things. Like you cannot be part of like the climate change club and the private equity club and entrepreneurship and luxury goods all at the same time. Like, yes, you can be a part of those clubs, but you are not really going to get the most out of your time there. Like kind of know what you're trying to do. Like the people who I feel like were the happiest with their experience were like, okay, I'm going in here to learn about these three things. Like I want to learn about climate change, like, you know, the future of mobility and like smart cities. And like, that is what they focused on. And they like went to every event related to that. And like, you know, really doubled down on that. For me, I, like the sports part is like a big part of like my life in general. So I was like, I just want to be involved with all the sports stuff and take all the sports classes. And that's part of what I did. Um, and then the other part of it was really the entrepreneurship piece. And so like, if I think about like my focus in business school, I really had two things and I still felt like I was overextended because you still have the social aspect that you have to remember. Oh, and you are sitting in class, even if you're like, okay, I'm not as much prioritizing academics. Like you are still sitting in class for a long time every day. And so don't underestimate that. Um, and so, yeah, so in terms of getting the most out of that, like make sure you know what you want. Like people who are just everywhere, like come out of business school, still very confused. Um, and then in terms of um, what I've gotten out of it, I would say like, you know, all the startup classes are awesome. Um, you know, if you can take them, like take them. I think like the professors you meet are really cool. Like they're all like top of their field, et cetera. And like have super interesting insights. Um, and I would say like, honestly, like I feel like I just had a lot of reflection during that time. A lot of my second year was taking classes like lives of consequence, like art of self coaching, really thinking about like, you know having that forced time, like a couple hours, like a week to like really think about like, what do I want to do and what brings me joy? Like is a huge difference. Cause like, you know, you think you can do it while you're working, but like you're like, I'm really tired after this. Like, I'm going to go to sleep and like, you don't do it. And so like having a lot of the structured, like soft skills and like reflection, I think was actually a really big piece in my second year in business school. I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree with everything, everything you just said. I think that, that that is truly in cast place, like knowing what you want and then kind of being, um, you know, very uh, determined to sort of pursue those things without being distracted by all the other things that are going on. Um, last topic we'll spend time on, um, you know, your entrepreneurial journey. You kind of have to have this like, very aspirational career, right? In terms of kind of in banking, then working at a, a kind of a, a high growth startup, then kind of going to the, you know, one of the top business schools in the world. And then now being an entrepreneur, I get a lot of questions from, from our audience, whether they're young professionals, whether they're sort of post MBA or even an undergrad saying, Hey, I think I want to be an entrepreneur one day. Right. So, so maybe now that, you know, you founded your own company or, or Santa as a co-founder, like what are some of the lessons learned that, you know, people should go in with their eyes wide open, but also from lessons learned, given the experience that you had in yeah. being uh, a founder of, of, of a, you know, of, of a growth startup? Yeah, I would say, here's the thing. We glorify and like really lionize the people who dropped out of college and knew exactly what they wanted to do when they were 21, right? Not everyone's going to be that person. Like maybe you going through the banking or like private equity, et cetera, like it's going to help you a lot. I know I personally probably wouldn't have been able to found this company had I not had a lot of those experiences and feel like I checked a lot of those boxes before. And I think every person's journey is super, super different, right? Like it's like, you know, you don't have to be eating ramen noodles in your car, like and like living like, you know, in a trailer to like, you know, feel like you are doing it right. Like, I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. And so like, I think, you know, the thing that I've learned the most is there's no one right way to do entrepreneurship. Like everybody has their opinions and has their advice. And like, you will even get people like VCs who are like, you must have all full-time founders. You must have X, Y, Z, right? Like, but then you also see a lot of successful companies that had like a team of five, which is like, sounds insane. And then they had three people part-time, but then they grew to be a like great company and they bootstrapped all the way and never took any money, right? Like, and so you just never really know exactly what and like how you're going to start it. And like, so I would say be open, but also like, you know, that like know what's right for you. Like, you know, when the right time is and you'll be comfortable making that jump. Like, 
I was comfortable making this jump at this point in my life because like of a bunch of like life reasons, I don't have a mortgage, et cetera. Um, but like for like some people aren't going to be willing to make that jump until maybe they're 40. Maybe some people are going to be like right after banking, I'm good. Like I'm out. Um, and so I think it just really depends on you and like, don't really let people tell you what to do in terms of this, because I like, I feel like you have to be a little crazy to be an entrepreneur. Like you got to be willing to run into the brick wall repeatedly. And so like, you know, there's no one right way to do it. And only, you know, when you're ready to like go after that. I, I actually love that advice. Um, and the only thing I'll add to that is picking an idea or picking something you were like genuinely like, you know, very much interested in as much as you think it's like a great business opportunity. Right. I think, I think yeah. the, the point that Jane made about running into brick wall and, and we do that as a kind of it elevates that as well. Like, you know, there's just things that you have to be like willing to be okay with the disappointment of kind of the ups and downs of sort of, sort of doing this stuff. So totally agree um, with that. And then maybe the last question I'll ask is sort of on the, on the entrepreneurial side, like where, you know, what is your sort of, I want, I want kind of on the, on the Frankie side, like what are your near time goals? How do you define what, how to determine those near time goals, whether it's sort of profitability, whether it's sort of growth, et cetera, based on what you saw at Uber and other experiences before? Yeah, I think there's, um, a desire by both me and my co-founder to be a little more thoughtful about spend, um, obviously, because we also don't have unlimited capital, but we also want to build a business that like we know is profitable versus being like, okay, like, you know, we'll be profitable down the line. Like we're just going to grow really fast and like see what happens. And so for us, we really want to be mindful about like how we grow also and like make sure we are not getting like, you know, she said like something like too big for our bridges. <laughs> um, and so like, you know, obviously that is like a great problem to have, but like, being thoughtful about how we spend, like not just like dumping a ton of money into like paid or like something like that, like thinking about what are the organic channels? How do we think about like the cheapest way to acquire customers? And obviously I'm sure Uber did a lot of this too, but it's just like, you know, over time, like LTV to like, you know, CAC, right. Became very different because like for them, they had all these marketplace dynamics to think about. And we don't really have that. We are a D to C business. Like it is not that hard, like LTV to CAC, like that is not going to like, we, we cannot let that get out of whack. Um, and so it's a little bit different in that sense. Um, I think in terms of goals, I think Heather and I, um, my co-founder really want to build a workplace that I think we're proud of and build a product that people love. I think that's something that is probably the biggest thing for the two of us, considering that both of us have worked in a lot of places that had like a lot of ups and downs. And like, we really want to be intentional about building a culture, like feeling people feeling like they can be their whole selves at work and like all those other things, like you know, like that is something that is probably the number one goal for us. I think the second thing is just like making sure, you know, like we are promising a lot, like, you know, we're like, okay, you guys can go brawl us, et cetera. I don't have to wear this thing again. Like we need to make sure like people actually love this product and like iterate on it until it's like perfectly right. And like, we think we have a great product um, in terms of what's coming out, but obviously there will always be improvements and it's possible that, you know, like maybe it's not going to work on like certain body types. And like, we need to like figure out a lot of that too. Um, but like trying to remember also, we can't be like balancing, we can't be everything to everyone and making a great product. Like, I think that is probably like the biggest challenge and also like goal that I'm thinking about for like the next like two to four years. Yeah. I love that. I think the last point they made up, um, well, first of all, I'm confident you guys will be very successful knowing you and sort of knowing that, knowing your sort of drive, passion and ability. But the second thing you mentioned, I think it's, that's an important thing for anyone who's coming from a background. I mean, I struggle with this with, with, with a lot of the entrepreneurial stuff, right? Is, is you're kind of used to there being a right answer. You're used to sort of people telling you you're doing a great job. You're sort of people, you know, everyone liking your product. But now to the point you're like, what do you mean 20% of the people don't love my product? So I, I think genuinely like, the, 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 the easier you can get away from that mindset of everyone patting you on your back, I think maybe the better it is. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's like not collecting gold stars, right? Like, I think the thing that, like about this, that's really hard is like, you know, I tell my co-founder all the time. I was like, I did a lot of work today. I worked really hard. I used hundred percent of my brain. I don't even know if I worked on the right thing today. Was that the right thing for the business? You don't get that feedback at like, you know, Goldman or like Uber, like people are like, you did great. Like y'all go home. Like, you know, you know, you did enough. Like here it's like, managing yourself like you're like okay like you know at the end of the day sometimes you have to be like I did enough like just because I did not do that is not going to cause my business to fail and like feel good about that and so you know I think that is really hard in terms of like the careers we've had we're used to getting the pats on the back like the gold stars like all those things that that is not there anymore and that is like something that I'm figuring out how to manage still yeah I love it um, any any yes. thoughts on kind of what, what you know about elevating on our platform here yeah, I do think like, okay, so the matching thing is awesome because I was like, 
you know, you are close with your analyst class, but like, you never really know anybody at the other, like, you know, 10 or like 12 banks, like that are like, you know, in like somewhat of the same tier, right? Like, and so like getting to know a lot of people who either are similar in that way, like I think is like awesome. Like a couple of my closest friends are actually like from my industrials group. Like we're still in a group text and we talk all the time. And so some of those friendships are like the best thing that I got from banking, right? Like other than like, obviously the work experience and all that. Um, And so I think that's awesome. And obviously like, this is clearly like an incredible resource in terms of like, you know, in one place, like what to think about, like how to think about things, like what to study, like how to like reach out to people. Like, you know, I think it's a wealth of information that like everybody should just take advantage of, especially if you're trying to break into banking, break into private equity, break into investing. Like, I think like, you know, I haven't really seen like a wealth of information in one place like that. And like, you know, it was always, it always felt very like, everywhere on the internet looking at wall street oasis being like is this person telling the truth um and like this is actually like you know this is a platform where you know it's like true and it's not like you know some crazy person like in a bunker somewhere telling you about their banking experience or their comp right um and so i think it's just like a great like platform for everything honestly awesome no thank you for that thank you by the way jane